You know, one of the most amazing things we're learning is that the brain is continually being sculpted by experience. And this, of course, happens in childhood, but it happens in adolescence and adulthood as well. And so we know that the experiences we have shapes the way the brain is structured. And this shaping takes the place in the connections among the neurons in the brain, and those connections, in a way, dance with the way the mind emerges. So how we think and how we feel, how we relate to ourselves and relate to others, has a lot to do with the kind of experiences we have, especially early on in life. Well, to be mindful, from a formal definition, means to be intentionally aware of experience as it's unfolding and not to be lost in judgment, so people call that non-judgmental. And it's done with intention, that is, you have the intention to be very present. Over time, if you practice this enough, and in a regular kind of way, hopefully every day, even if it's just for five minutes a day, what happens is the state of mindfulness can become a trait. From a brain point of view, what that means is that creating a state is the firing of neurons together in a certain fashion. And then once we create that state of neural firing, the neurons actually strengthen their connections with each other. So what is a temporary state becomes a long-term trait because you've changed the structure of the brain. For thousands of years, people have been practicing mindfulness in the East. It's also been a practice in the West, and not only in ancient times, but in modern times. In fact, when we look at cultures across our planet, all major cultures have a practice to encourage the members of the community to actually be present in the moment. And the claims have always been that this practice would help people be healthier, that it would promote well-being. And in recent times, we now have the science to suggest that those claims are actually true. In the brain, you have a way of assessing for whether things are dangerous or safe. If they're dangerous, you can fight them, you can flee from them, you can even freeze. In any of those three choices, you're limiting learning. So when a child feels endangered, they want to fight, flee, or freeze. And this natural reaction to danger shuts down being open to learning. When you focus on the breath, I believe what happens is you're activating not the danger circuitry that's beneath the cortex, but actually you're activating the safety circuitry and you're allowing the self to create a sense of safety within one's own experience because of this integrative harmony that's created that then allows a person to basically be in what one researcher calls a state of love without fear. And if I have what I call mind sight, the ability to reflect on the nature of the mind in myself as well as in others, I'm actually being given a skill that, of course, is going to help me in every aspect of my life. So in a way, it's a no-brainer that it would be improving academic improvement because what you're seeing there is the person is using the mind to achieve academically. And these reflective skills that are taught in social and emotional intelligence that are essentially mindfulness skills are ways in which we can help children develop these mind sight abilities. To see the mind of yourself and others is really a way of describing what is the root mechanism of social and emotional intelligence. When you develop this part of the brain called the insula that allows, let's say, the taste of the tomato, the smell of the tomato, the texture of the tomato, all those senses to come up into awareness, um, then you're changing the whole dynamics of how the brain is functioning and the mind will use it in a different way so that, for example, if I'm now going to interact with a friend and she's really upset because someone's been bullying her on the school playground, right? Her experience of being upset 
will enter me through a set of neurons called the mirror neurons. They're going to interact with another part of my brain and then go down through that insula, down and influence my body in a way where my body will become filled with her feeling of being upset. It's not that I'm going to mirror her, but I will become resonant with her. I will be changed because I'm open to what her experience is. I then, this will take just a few moments, and I will then be filled with this feeling. I will look at her and I will say, because I will become aware of my own internal upset feeling, attribute it to her through areas in my brain right here in the cortex and say, that doesn't feel good. What that person did to you is not right. Let's go together and tell the teacher. And I will not tolerate bullying, even if it's bullying of someone else, because I am joined with another human being. And some people approach mindfulness and say, oh, well, this is just kind of some self-preoccupation. You know, you want someone to mindfully taste a tomato. What's that? How self-indulgent is that? And actually, it's just the opposite. The circuitry that this mindfulness of a tomato builds is actually the same circuitry as that we need for compassion. Mindfulness is more than just focusing attention. Mindfulness is actually a way of building up these circuits of our social functioning. So when we wish loving kindness to others and ourselves, when we wish people be happy and healthy and safe and have well-being, and we bring gratitude for what we have and gratitude for others, then kindness and compassion become as natural in our lives when we're mindful as breathing is to life itself. You know, a lot of parents are concerned that because it's a competitive world, they want their children to be spending all their time developing skills like math and reading and things like that. And yet the research actually shows that when kids lack social intelligence, when they lack emotional intelligence, they can have all the skills in the world and they actually will not be competitive for long-term achievement in their careers, for achieving happiness, and for having well-being inside of themselves or healthy relationships. So you may say, well, you know, how do I allow kids to become less impulsive? And this fifth function of the middle prefrontal area that we were talking about called response flexibility. Response flexibility is the capacity to pause before you act. It creates a spaciousness of the mind to notice that an impulse has arisen and to disconnect from the automatic behavior that usually follows when someone's an impulsive person, in quotes. So mindfulness creates a space between impulse and action that allows us to be more flexible in our responses, hence response flexibility. Now you could say, well, that's pretty amazing. Does it really occur? We were able to show in people with deficits in their functioning, that is, they're impulsive, they actually become less impulsive with mindfulness practice. Why? Because if you think about it from a mindset point of view, you're giving the person the skill of being aware of their interior, previously invisible world. So instead of being on automatic pilot, living in a mindless way, the person now is aware someone has just insulted me, I have an impulse to hit them, and instead of just the arm going out and hitting them, maybe their muscles get tense, they now have the spaciousness of mind with interoception to be aware of the interior world, to perceive one's own interior world. And so the muscles may get tense, and I, I notice the mind is creating an impulse to hit. I must be angry. I think I won't hit this person. And you stop, and you choose an alternative path. That's what mindsight allows you to do. It's what mindfulness skills create.